Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in Milan. Uh, thank you, Nestle, for the invitation to speak. Um, thank you, Professor Correa, for uh, a tour de force of the history of setting nutritional requirements. I'm going to focus on protein and optimizing amino acid and protein intake for musculoskeletal health during periods of rest or disuse. So this is a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about. First, we talk about protein and contraction induced changes in muscle protein synthesis, which amino acids are the most important, what happens when we age, and then what happens when we're in a situation of aging and disuse, which I call the perfect storm for muscle loss. And if we have a situation like that, how do we reclaim lost muscle? What works? And then I'll wrap up. So first of all, just a little bit of background information. You've probably seen these curves lots of times. Uh, the analogy I use, it's like a brick wall. Proteins go into the brick wall, they make it bigger or they renew it. The proteins or the building blocks are obviously amino acids. They're also taken out of the brick wall. So you can see muscle protein synthesis here in yellow. You can see muscle protein breakdown in red. And you can see the areas of green which represent muscle protein accretion and the areas in blue which represent muscle protein loss. This happens on a meal to meal and an hour to hour basis. And you can see that these two processes are going on simultaneously. This is incorrectly represented because because it's easy to draw curves like this. And it implies that everybody eats the same amount of protein at each meal, but as you'll see, it's actually a dose responsive system. So in summary, what happens is you get a balanced mixed meal containing proteins that are eaten regularly and you maintain muscle mass. That would be the situation after the age of probably 18 to probably somewhere in our 30s. Uh, I know that's a news flash. After your 30s, you probably begin to tip down just a little bit and I'll tell you why. Um, that's because behind this um, graphic here, I don't know if it's going to go away, if you lift weights, you get enhanced anabolic uh, reaction. And what happens is you stimulate protein synthesis, and at the same time, you reduce muscle protein breakdown. So the loss of muscle mass is actually smaller. Over a period of time, of course, this is going to lead to muscle mass accretion if you're lifting weights or you're doing something resistive in nature. If you're a younger person, it can work in older people, but it's probably more about mitigation of the loss of muscle mass than it is the gain. So the situation is a little bit different when we have somebody who's in a state of disuse because in this situation, we have what we refer to as anabolic resistance. Anabolic resistance is akin to insulin resistance. In other words, the muscle now becomes refractory to the normal hyperamino acidemia that would normally stimulate a robust rise in protein synthesis and maybe a small suppression of protein breakdown as well. So you can see that over time, you either need to eat more protein if this is a dose responsive system or you need to eat more of a specific amino acid, and hopefully I'll tell you which ones those are. So unloading of muscle, or via bed rest, or we use a local model where we cast a limb, and providing people with a balanced or mixed protein-containing meal regularly, we get less stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. That's the locus of control until we get into a profound inflammatory state like we would see in the ICU. In the ICU, it's not just muscle disuse, it's profound hypercytokinemia, hypercatabolic hormone environments where you get enhanced proteolysis. And then it's really difficult to stimulate this system. So to show you that it's a dose responsive system, this is some data from a former PhD student of mine, Dan Moore. And this is the rate of muscle protein synthesis in younger men given increasingly larger doses of protein after they have performed resistance exercise. But it would be exactly the same if I showed you what happens after they haven't performed resistance exercise. What you see is that the response essentially plateaus at around 20 grams. Uh, we realized at the time that there had to be a little bit of a range in that because if you were smaller, you would require less or if you were larger, you would require more. 
we don't express protein requirements in absolute terms. We express them relative to people's body weight. So if you wanted to average it out, it was about 0.25 grams of protein per kilogram per feed. But remember, this is in an enhanced anabolic state, so it's probably even higher if you're in a rested state. So which amino acids are most important? And the answer is pretty simple. There's one amino acid, and you can feed cells various combinations and look at their anabolic response. You can infuse this into rodents. You can infuse it into humans. It doesn't matter, but this single amino acid, leucine, which is one of the three branch chain amino acids, triggers a canonical pathway that's preserved from yeast all the way up to the highest mammals, in other words, humans. There's the structure, I'm sure you remember it from lots of biochemistry classes. Those are the pathways that you love to hate. And we now have a mechanism for how this works, thanks to David Sabatini's lab at MIT. Just to show you how powerful this amino acid is, this is some work uh, conducted by Tyler churchward Vinay when he was working with my group. We've got two conditions here I want you to focus on, one in gray, one in black, where we've got a small dose of whey protein, a large dose of whey protein, and then the white bars give you the small dose of whey protein to which we've added back five grams of leucine. And you can see you get a stimulation of muscle protein synthesis with every dose, but it persists for hours later only in the situation where you feed the large dose or you feed the small dose with the added leucine. Now, five grams of leucine is a lot of leucine, so this was a proof of principle study. I don't know whether you've ever tasted amino acids, probably not too many of you do that, but it's extraordinarily bitter leucine. So I wouldn't recommend this at home, but we can get some university students to do it in the lab. <laughs> just to convince you that it's not just university students, this is work from Keelan Murphy. And you can see that the fractional synthetic rate, or the protein synthetic rate now, is over days. So we've evolved a method now where we get people to ingest deuterated water, and we use the natural labeling of alanine and the incorporation of it into the muscle over a period of as long of up to about six weeks, if you like. But this is about five days apart. This is in older men. And in each of these scenarios, these older men got a drink that contained five grams of leucine or a placebo. You can see in the rested condition, which would be on your right, um, the, the leucine enhances the anabolic response, and it doesn't matter whether you were consuming lower protein, which was the RDA, or 1.2. It enhances the anabolic effect. Now, if the RDA were adequate, this shouldn't work. You should not get a stimulation of protein synthesis. So I, I don't know how many times I can say this, but we have to move beyond nitrogen balance and begin to pay attention to methods that are a little bit more current. The graph on your further uh, left-hand side is resistance exercise, and it makes everything better, which is indicated by the two dagger symbols there. But you can see, even with the star, when you add the leucine, it enhances the anabolic response, and so you get this synergism of exercise and the added leucine. Now, again, five grams of leucine is a lot. This is in older men, so we've got it in young men, we've got it in older men, and just to show you that we're not too provincial, this is a study done by Michaela de Vries in older women. But we changed the paradigm here a little bit. Instead of adding extra leucine, we just incorporated a higher quality leucine, high leucine containing drink into the diets of these women over a period of a week. And we got a little bit cute here. Instead of having a resistance exercise group and a non-resistance, we only exercise one of their legs so that you can see the effect compared to the other control. So the rested leg with the added leucine better than the placebo. The exercised leg always better than rest. Add the leucine and you get the synergism of the two. So I think that that's fairly convincing evidence that we've got this trigger hypothesis that leucine has to accumulate inside the cell bind to that protein I showed you in the Sabatini diagram called Cestrin-2, 
That relieves an inhibition on mTOR. We get translocation to the light. I won't bore you with the details, but that's how this is working. So we know the molecular target. So leucine is the amino acid that triggers this. The trigger is mobile, as you can see here. It moves. And the way it moves is when you're active. But you have to keep doing it. In other words, if you stop exercising, then you go back to the state that you were before. But clearly, the trigger can go in the opposite direction. So if you're immobile, or if you're on bed rest, then you either need more protein or you need more leucine. But we have a rather famous saying in our lab that it's very difficult to out-nutrition inactivity. It requires a lot of energy, particularly if you're in a hypercatabolic state, and more protein. Just to remind you that not all proteins are created equal. This is expressing what I call the leucine amino acid reference ratio in milk from right to left, milk proteins, whey proteins, two different forms of soy proteins, pea protein, rice protein, and collagen, to show you how much of these proteins you would have to consume to sort of be equivalent to each other to get the same dose of leucine. And at the same time, to take you all the way back to this is an absolutely classic paper. Yves Boiry is the first author, Bernard Beaufrere, the last author. And I thought I'd just flash the metrics up there. And 979 citations is, uh, that's more than a citation classic. This is amazing stuff. Is that fast and slow proteins together, the combination, because you get the rapid stimulation of protein synthesis with whey protein because of its rapid leucine appearance, and you get the prolonged stimulation because you get the supporting cast of all the essential amino acids, and that's the casein. What about other compounds? So if you live in my other world, which is to hang around with bodybuilders, I, I'm not one, obviously. Um, it, despite my attempts at lifting weights, I'm nowhere near as big as most of these guys. They have attempted to manipulate nutrition for years. And the company Experimental Applied Science developed this compound, which is beta-hydroxy, beta-methylbutyrate, or what we know as beta-HMB. It's a leucine analog. It's a leucine cousin, if you like. But humans don't possess the dioxygenase enzyme that we can make this. But we can make things like ketoisocaproic acid, which is the keto acid of leucine. And all of these compounds have remarkably similar effects to leucine because they're all metabolically interrelated, and I've given you the structures there. Now, we conducted an umbrella review of systematic reviews of beta-HMB, and this was nothing other than to show that in our minds, this was functionally very similar to leucine. But I can tell you that we were a little bit dismayed at the number of reviews that came out with a positive conclusion. So most reviews said that beta-HMB did not affect strength outcomes or measures where studies were inconclusive. And that's not dissimilar from protein supplementation. Because for protein to work, you have to be doing something to be physically active. The current evidence, then, is insufficient to assess the impact of HMB supplementation on functional outcome measures, including instrumental activities of daily living. And we found inconsistent support for lean soft tissue mass changes, which is really DEXA, and what a lot of people call muscle, and it's not, uh, or improvement of strength. And there was no evidence that improves physical function. And this was a graph that we included in the review just to make our point that when you give equimolar quantities of either leucine, the free acid of HMB, or the calcium form of HMB, you get pretty much an equivalent stimulation of muscle protein synthesis. So it didn't surprise us that we got outcomes that were sort of lukewarm for this compound. It's a cousin of leucine. So what happens with aging? Well, there's probably 12 now, up to 14 accepted mechanisms of aging. And I, I don't want to pick on any one in particular, but there are lots of them. But I will talk about dysregulated nutrient sensing, which you've already seen with anabolic resistance. This is Dan Moore's retrospective analysis of all the data that we had when we combined all of our methods that were identical 
combine them with data from uh, Oliver Wittard and Kevin Tipton, and to show you that the curve shifts to the right in the aging population, which you can see on your left-hand side. So it takes about 70% more protein to stimulate the equivalent muscle protein synthetic rate in an older individual than it does a younger individual. So this anabolic resistance is a reality. We could recreate this in young people by making them inactive. And everything as it ages, from earthworms all the way up to human beings, does less. So there's clearly a component of disuse with that. But you can add in a confluence of another group of aging factors as well. So aging and disuse becomes this perfect storm for the loss of muscle mass. And I really do have to make a shout out at this point to a very good friend of mine, uh, Doug Padden Jones, who introduced the concept of the catabolic crisis. And essentially what Doug, uh, who unfortunately passed away way too young, uh, gave us this, this lesson uh, about the catabolic crisis in which you experience a period of disuse, but the catabolic crisis could also be layered on top of acute respiratory distress syndrome. Or, and nobody really gave this too much thought, I said, maybe it's just like putting your feet up and not doing too much, or you've got a bad flu. And a lot of physicians said, oh, well, how many people get the flu? And then COVID happened. So a, a lot of people kind of got the flu. A lot of people died, and a lot of people stayed at home and did nothing. Or a lot of people recovered from COVID and then convalesced at home for two to three weeks. And in two to three weeks, you lose muscle mass, you get weaker, and you become insulin resistant, particularly after you've come out from a hospital stay. So a huge tribute to uh, Kirk English and Doug Patton Jones for this paper. So what works to reclaim lost muscle? What can we do? Hopefully you survive that catabolic crisis, and how do we bring it back? Well. I had the pleasure of writing this paper with Doug before he passed away and with Don Lehman, and we pushed this message really heavy. And hopefully you got a chance to listen to Professor Luke Van Loon two days ago in this room talking about how important early mobility was. So early mobilization and early physical therapy. There's probably a case for timing the protein consumption right after you finish the physical therapy because that's when the muscle is, so, is the most sensitive. So it's no good to have breakfast, do your PT session, and then wait for three hours for lunch. Or do it in the afternoon and wait five hours for the dinner to be served. You may have lost the anabolic window that you had from that PT session. It's got to be high quality protein with high leucine. I think that has to be emphasized. There are probably other ingredients that enhance the efficacy of protein. We could talk about omega-3s, we could talk about creatine, we could talk about vitamin D, for example. So mitigating the decline via an aggressive introduction of physical therapy to allow patients to recover, rather than trying to bend the curve back up, which is almost practically impossible in an older patient who maybe has other comorbidities. And this is just to emphasize something to you. This is data that Beth Phillips' lab at the University of Nottingham has produced to show you how little energy and protein post-surgical patients consume. So it's got the ESPEN guidelines on there. You can see them in gray. And this is post-op patients who are going in for elective colorectal cancer surgery and how much they consume. So in the few days that they didn't consume the type of energy that we would like them to consume, the protein, they lost 9% 9, 9 of their quadricep muscle cross-sectional area in five days. We know that the action happens early. So the intervention has to come during this period to aggressively try and address this. And so you know, 500 and some odd calories a day is nowhere near even what Professor Correa just pointed out was even the basal needs of these patients. And the mean daily protein intake was about 15 grams. So we have this vicious cycle of inactivity and disuse where people go into hospital, it may be for something as benign as, you know, acute respiratory distress due to flu. 
They come back from the hospital, they convalesce at home. If you've ever spent time in the northern United States or Canada, you'll know that the winters are not fun. And so you come home from having the flu, and you look outside and you see the ice, and you're like, I don't want to go out there. I might slip and fall. And besides, it's minus, you know, it doesn't matter, Celsius or Fahrenheit. It's cold. So you stay at home, and, and, and you do nothing. And you're socially isolated, and all of these factors are now combining to make this spiral a little bit. And, and Canadian geriatricians, and I'm sure geriatricians everywhere, talk about older people having a, a bad winter. And it's simply a period of disuse and probably, I don't know, malnutrition, but undernutrition that is forcing this spiral down. So this period of disuse essentially is the key and I think triggering point, an aggressive nutritional and exercise support. So we're trying to put a puzzle together where we've got protein, we've got energy, and we've got mobility and maybe some other ingredients, and that's the top piece there that I can't talk about or won't talk, don't have time to talk about, that I think when you put them together really uh, would create a situation for reclaiming lost muscle. So protein synthesis is stimulated by hyperaminoacidemia. It's potentiated by loading, so get your patients active. Muscle disuse and aging induce anabolic resistance in skeletal muscle, and their confluence is the worst situation. Leucine is the key amino acid. It's like the player coach. It comes in, blows the whistle, says, okay, guys, we got to work. But then it's part of the team as well. So you need all of the essential amino acids. Age-related anabolic resistance or disuse-related anabolic resistance can be overcome, but it requires larger doses of protein and probably some adjunctive ingredients. So aging and disuse represent the perfect storm. I haven't even talked about the ICU where we could have uh, hypercortisolemia, hypercytokinemia, iatrogenic undernutrition, people who still persist in not putting feeding tubes down or starting parenteral nutrition. And I'm not a clinician, so I'm not at the coal face of doing this, but all of this seems to me, if you can get that sort of loss in those surgical patients in five days, Imagine somebody in the ICU. So higher protein, higher leucine, higher essential amino acids with sufficient energy and higher mobilization and activity are really, I think, the recipe in putting the puzzle together uh, for muscle, uh, for older patients in particular. So thank you very much.